Okay. Hello and welcome to another episode for MC Airsoft. I am Mark and today we're going to be discussing five ways you can save money in Airsoft. Now, yeah, that's a little bit of a clickbait title and depending where you live or where you shop, maybe these things will not save you money or maybe they will. But overall, I think most people will save some money if they do some variation of these five things, right? <clears throat> now, the first one is going to be bulk buys, right? Whether that is ammo or other protective equipment or buying two radios in a package deal versus one, uh, bulk buys um, break down into two sections. One's going to be individual use and the other's going to be team use, right? Now, on the note of team use, of course, you can split the cost of a support weapon or a DMR or something like that with a team or squad or whatever you want to call that. If your team or squad is willing to do that, uh, going to some mill sims, it's always advantageous to have a saw, but saws are pretty expensive or support guns in general are pretty expensive and they cost more to feed because you're running full auto and you have a big old drum on the bottom so some things to keep in mind with that but if your team is willing to split up the cost or your uh, squad is willing to split up the cost that's one way of going about it but on a, on a smaller note a more universal note if you have two people that are willing to buy your bale fang or whatever style radios then you can save money on that by getting package deal right where you yourself probably not gonna be a uh, be using two radios you know maybe at some of the bigger mill sims if you have squad comms and comms back to hq that's going to be a thing but for most people zero or one radios that's that's where you're at right you're not getting two radios just for yourself unless you need a backup in case one breaks or something like that so going to your team and say you have a team of four people and you buy two packages which might be a little more expensive but you can split the cost of two packages to four people so you all have radios, you all have the same radio, <clears throat> and also you're paying half of that package rather than everyone buying their individual radios. Um, same thing can be done with other things, you know, um, dead rags. Uh, you can either buy your one dead rag or you can go and buy a pack of 10 flags or a pack of 10 uh, shop rag, red shop rags if they're the right size or something like that. And then you can split that cost amongst the group rather than just paying for it as an individual. So that's one way. The other way is as an individual bulk buying. Um, a good example of this is BBs or gas uh, or grenades Maybe it's just CO2 cartridges, right? If you buy a tw uh, 20 box of CO2 cartridges instead of the 10 box, you're gonna save money per CO2 cartridge. And most people who are getting into Airsoft, if they make it past their first couple games out, make it past that renter phase, if you will, they're probably gonna stick around for a minute. Right, so you're probably gonna use all 20 of those CO2 cartridges over the course of time. Uh, whereas if you buy two packs of 10, you're gonna be spending more per CO2 cartridge. Uh, same thing with gas. If you're running gas pistols or gas rifles, buying a pack of five is gonna be cheaper per can than buying a pack of one or two. Uh, same with BBs. If you can buy a bigger bag of BBs, more BBs, whatever the case is, then that's going to be cheaper per BB than going and buying your one or two uh, bottles or something like that. Um, now, of course, this 
doesn't pertain to well my uh, my company that I go to for BBs or green gas or whatever doesn't offer the bigger packages and I'm getting them cheaper so that really doesn't pertain but for most manufacturers most of these companies putting out these type of products they're gonna offer some kind of bulk deal like grenades they're you're gonna pay less if you buy more kind of thing so that's something to keep in mind my point number two is going to be to do your own teching or learn to do your own teching for the price that a lot of people are charging for tech work now of course if you have you know one guy in your group who does all the teching for free that's one thing right but uh, for most people if you have to go pay a tech it might be more uh, beneficial in the long run to learn to do the teching yourself to do the all the your own work because one, you get more intimate knowledge so you know, okay, my gun made this noise or uh, stopped working in this way. Now I know because I've done tech work that I only need this one part or these two parts to fix it, right? So you're gonna save money, hopefully, maybe on that. If you have a good tech, uh, an honest tech, you might not, right? But, um, that could be a way to save money, but also you're no longer paying tech rates, right? Which can get expensive. I've seen shops go upwards of $60 an hour for tech work, which if you're changing a spring, most people can do that on their own as long as they have a few good screwdrivers. <clears throat> and changing a spring on a quick change system will be under an hour, but a lot of trades uh, and a lot of shops will round up the hour, so you're gonna pay for at least one hour. So changing that spring, it's gonna be, you know, 10 to $20 for a spring, but then another surcharge of uh, $60 or so to, for the tech to go in, take out your gearbox, pop out the old spring, pop in a new spring, whatever the case is, and you're gonna end up paying that extra $60 um, you know, if you're changing out a gear set, that shouldn't take more than an hour or two, depending on your gearbox. Um, and now that's not including shimming, but you know, shim, shimming can add a lot more time to it. But, <clears throat> you know, changing out the gears should take an hour or two. You're paying 20, 30, 40, maybe dollars for a gear set, and then you're paying the tech 120 or however much for that. Learning to do your own tech work is gonna be hugely beneficial. And even if it's, even if you're looking at it as, okay, I don't have any tools, I need to buy a Dremel, I need to buy a screwdriver set, I need to buy, you know, a dead blow, things like that. That money, in my opinion, is better spent on tools and learning to do it yourself rather than trying to pay someone else to do it. Um, and then over time, if you stick with the hobby, you know, four or five years down the road, you're still maybe using the same tools that you started with as long as you buy good tools and then you're no longer paying tax, so you're saving that money. And not knocking techs, obviously they know more than the average person about the internal workings or maybe external workings of uh, the airsoft guns. But, you know, if you're looking to save money because airsoft can be a very expensive hobby, that's a good way of doing it. Third point, and maybe I should have made this number five, but uh, because of its importance, but, you know, um, it's uh, where I put it on the list. And it's going to be research. And that breaks down into three categories. One is going to be reading, you know, going on forums, reading reviews on a website, uh, whether that's a shop or just a review site or something of that nature. You know, going around and finding all the info you can because a lot of people will stick just to YouTube videos. And while that's a good source, it might not have complete information. It might not have all the information you're looking for. 
Um, and it's a lot easier to type out a response on a form rather than make a YouTube video. So you're going to get more opinions, generally speaking, if you go through a form or written um, sources than if you're solely sticking to YouTube. Now, if you have that one or two people you trust on YouTube, go for it. But for the average person, if you're trying to figure out, is this spring good? Is this gear set good? Is this, um, is this rail system going to fit onto my rifle? It's going to be more beneficial, generally speaking, to search forms and things like, and reviews on, uh, written reviews, that is, uh, online than it is going to be to look through all your, um, YouTube videos. Now, if there's a lot of YouTube videos on it, which typically for guns, there's more YouTube videos. Typically for parts and other things like that, it's going to be more written. Uh, and that's just what I've noticed. Although your product that you're looking for might vary that. Um, the second one is going to be reviews. Uh, so the first one is more just people talking back and forth about a thing. Um, the second one is just going to be purely reviews, whether that's from a shop or that is from a YouTuber or that is from someone who has a blog or you know, whatever the case is, just looking at an overview. Now, this generally pertains more to uh, your guns, your end items rather than parts, but you can still find good information on parts. So that's something to think about. Um, but look at your reviews, figure out not only is it good or bad, but is it going to work for what you're doing? For instance, if you take four reviews on, let's say, an adaptive armament PRC-15, well, three reviews might say it's shooting below 400, which it definitely was when I chronoed mine, but then you get two reviews saying it's shooting over 400, and your field's limit is 400, well, that's gonna be an issue, right? Or 350 if you're playing at an indoor field or 300, whatever the case is. Um, this gets a little more uh, beneficial looking into multiple reviews. If you're looking at gas-operated um, airsoft guns, being that if I, where I am right now, living at about 2,400 feet above sea level, I'm going to have a certain performance out of gas weapons, whereas if I go down the hill to the next city over and I'm down at about 400 feet above sea level, I might be shooting a little bit hotter, it might work a little bit better. Certain people live in a colder climate, certain people live in a warmer climate, so that's going to affect things. Um, also, maybe if you only look at one review, that person got a lemon or that person got a good one. Whereas if you look at multiple reviews, you're going to get an average view of the thing you're looking at. Uh, the third one, which I don't see often enough and I don't see it really talked about, is call attack, right? And I know this kind of goes against number two, doing your own teching. I'm not saying necessarily to bring it into them, but you can call them up, be like, hey, I have a Lancer, this model, or a Lancer Tactical, M4 or M16, whatever, uh, will an SHS gear set work in this gearbox? Will a SEMA forend work on this rifle? Now, of course, if you're buying maybe direct from China or something like that, like the uh, HAO um, products, maybe that's going to be a little bit different for you and you won't be able to have that resource, but when in doubt, call a tech or call a shop to see, you know, hey, what is this gun actually chronoing, chronoing at with point twos? And if it's a local shop, they might be able to uh, put BBs in it, fire it for you, get a chronograph reading for you because especially if like where I live, the closest um, airsoft store is three hours away you can call up and be like hey 
I am coming in to get this rifle. I want to make sure that it is shooting below my field's limits. Can you chrono it? Um, that way I'm not wasting a three or four hour drive. Um, so that's that can be an option as well. Or, you know, calling a tech to make sure certain parts are going to fit. Be like, hey, I'm ordering a Max Pro hop-up unit. Uh, I have this gearbox stock nozzle. Is this going to work with Max Pro unit? Or um, something of that nature. Or, hey, I'm thinking about getting a, a 7.2 LiPo or 11.6 LiPo and throwing it into this gun. What else do I need to do in order for bare minimum for to get it up to speed? Do I need to add a MOSFET? Do I need to add these things? And that can check some things off your list. And especially if you phrase it as being a customer or a potential customer, be like, Hey, I was in your store. I bought this gun from you guys. Um, I'm looking to do some upgrades on it now that the warranty's expired and things like that. Uh, which is another note, look at warranties. That's not one of my numbers, but look at warranties um, because that can save you some money as well if you don't void your warranty by like removing the orange tip or replacing parts. Uh, if you have a malfunction, it's gonna be a lot cheaper to send it back, get it fixed, unless you live outside of the, the US. Uh, send it back to the store, get it fixed, and have a new one sent out to you rather than trying to fix it yourself. If you're still within the warranty period, that's something to look at. Um, my point number four is going to be either to play locally or carpool. Now I understand this isn't going to be something that everyone can do and maybe your local field sucks and you want to drive two miles to a different field and that's on you, right? But if you have a group that is willing to play locally to save you some driving, or save you some fuel, um, uh, field expenses, right? Um, for instance, one of our guys here is gonna be setting up a CQB course on his back property, and he's okay with us coming out and shooting our airsoft guns, right? Um, and so that's gonna be a cheaper alternative and probably better, and we'll have input into the field than it is going to be to go to uh, Vegas for a paintball park, right? And see my video on why I hate paintball parks as well. But, um, you know, it could be, well, um, the next field away is two, uh, an hour, hour and a half, two hours, whatever the case is, but there's this wildlife preserve, which is where I mostly played at when I used to play and I'm playing mostly on federal land now anyway. Um, or maybe you're telling five or six people that, hey, I have this, uh, my backyard is huge, we can set up a course or something like that. Play locally and you'll save money not only in gas but in field fare. Um, now I, I do recommend going to your local fields for one variety and to, uh, to network, but if you can, play locally. And that brings us to the second half of part four, which is carpool. And so if you live in a big city and there's nowhere really to play, because I don't recommend playing inside city limits if you can help it, I don't recommend you know going down to a school after it closes and playing airsoft. That's a good way to get in a lot of trouble. Or playing around your neighborhood or playing in your backyard if you're in suburbia, right? I don't recommend that. It's a great way to get in a lot of trouble. So if you're living in a bigger city or something of that nature, you don't have any fields, you're not will you don't have the people in the area to set up a local field or something of that nature, carpool. Carpool with someone, right? Even if it's you know one other person that's still splitting the gas halfway and maybe one person pays for gas up, the other person pays for gas back, whatever the case is, or one person pays for gas this trip, and the other person pays for gas on the next trip. Carpooling is a great way to save money if you have to travel for a field. 
pretty self-explanatory other than that most people have carpooled, but that's something to consider. Uh, five is, if you've seen one of my other videos um, on this same subject, you'll, uh, you'll know it already, uh, but um, if not, go check that video out. Um, but it's going to be to buy inexpensive uh, uh, guns and upgrade them, right? Because one, you're going to, generally speaking, um, get a better product, right? Uh, or not necessarily better overall, but better for, suited for what you want. Um, and two, you're generally speaking going to save some money on that. Now, what I would recommend with that is buy the gun you like externally and then upgrade, right? If you buy a gun um, like this, which is an adaptive armament PRC-15, which is pretty well good. All I've done is change the um, spring and right now I'm running the barrel from a Mark 12 because that's down for repairs. But this is a really good base rifle, but I didn't like it externally. Externally, I've spent more money than internal repairs. So if I'd spent the extra a little bit and bought the gun that I like externally, uh, and then upgraded the internals, probably would have been better off doing that. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, external parts are generally fairly expensive for what you're getting, right? The rail system on this was $100. The uh, flash suppressor was $25. Um, those are things that don't really matter to the functionality of it. So, you know, if you want something unique or special or whatever, you're going to pay for that, obviously, but, but try and find something you you like externally and only upgrade the internals. Um, or vice versa, maybe you find a gearbox and barrel and all that that you like internally and you're only upgrading the, uh, in, uh, the external. So try and get as much as you want to get you to that finished product that you're looking for right out of the box and then we're, uh, look at your upgrades. But generally speaking, you can buy a uh, G, uh, JG uh, M4, M16A4 like I did and then you can build it out to be a DMR kind of rifle I know it's not 7.62, but whatever. Most people don't care about that. Um, and you can build it out over time versus buying a higher-end Mark 12 or a higher-end M16 or something of that nature. Um, you can do something like that. Um, for instance, a VFC gearbox is only in the range of $100 or so. So you can take that G and G, or sorry, JG M16, drop a uh, VFC gearbox, and yeah, the externals aren't as good, but you can drop that gearbox in there and have a lot of the same performances, if not the exact same performances, especially once you change out the hop of unit and barrel, which all together you're still under that $400 mark that you're probably paying for an equivalent rifle from um, from one of the higher end manufacturers, right? Um, this kind of also plays into the research aspect of do your research, find as many parts as you like in a gun for as cheap as you can, and then worry about getting upgrades from there and you're gonna save money. Uh, something like this rifle, the PRC-15, has all SHS parts uh, internally, has solid compression, um, had a really nice barrel in it. Obviously the original one, I'm doing something different right now. Uh, once the Mark 12 is up and running again, then, because um, that's my problem child, uh, then this barrel is going back in that and they're gonna switch back. But, um, you know, this rifle, honestly, maybe not from an external quality standpoint, but definitely from an internal quality standpoint, hangs out with much more expensive guns. It was out shooting some, um, the Crytek um, uh, Chris Vector, uh, no problem. 
uh, when we, I took it out to a local field and it was keeping up in the realm of uh, some of the more expensive upgraded guns. Uh, like, um, but uh, obviously is it outperforming $400 rifles? Maybe not every single time, but it's doing pretty good. Um, but yeah, that'd be my advice. Buy inexpensive and upgrade, but try and get as many things as you want out of your final product into your initial purchase, um, and then upgrade from there. And obviously that plays into doing your research and doing your own tech work. But with that being said, that's about all I want to say on this topic. Um, I'll see you next time. Until then, stay safe and stay hydrated.